Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Next up on the Mutual Audio Network, Fiction from Our Future. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. By 2031, global warming was real. Ice and fire would describe the next 2,000 years. Exploring the remade world in a new beginning starts now. Ian Kyleson's story intertwined with the deadly dangers involved with humans returning to the surface. It's the year 4062. You're listening to The Kyleson Chronicles, an audio drama with a twist. This is a Privy Projects production. Cassie, I know what happens today. Please wipe that look off your face. He better get up. He's going away today. This first survey is about as important as it gets. Six months of intense training. And I still don't understand why Mom and I had to do the training too. I know we're his backups, but nothing's going to happen to him. He's too good at all of that stuff they crammed into our heads. I guess there is some logic to preparing us, too. I sure hope Two Feathers, Lars, and Kelly are on time. Mom, are you ready? It's nearly 0800. I've got all my stuff in my backpack. I'm ready. You know you're not leaving through the tunnels this time. This will be the first time the main entrance will be unsealed in 2031 years. I know! What a day! No one but Elder Johnson, you and Cassie, will know we've gone. Why all the secrecy? Because, Dimwit, there are too many people scared of leaving the Freehold. The Elders didn't want protesters. He's gotta be crazy. Why wouldn't anyone want to stop living like moles in a hole? People are afraid of change. This will be a huge change. The latest estimate is seven years before we've all migrated to the surface. They have to get ready. The Freehold will be a ghost town before that time has passed. It's sad because it should be preserved as a museum or a monument. I don't know about that. When I finally found that we were living behind centuries old steel doors tied to historical outlaw Bell Star, I wondered why they actually chose this site. With that, they walked out of their quarters. They met Two Feathers, Lars, and Kelly coming up the tunnel toward them. Twenty long minutes later, they got to the Freehold's main doors. There were two platoons of militia and Elder Johnson waiting. You lot didn't waste time. We just got here ourselves. Why are the troops here? The days of being unprepared are behind us, I hope. Ian and company are just going for a walkabout. Why would there be trouble? It is safer because people, once human or ours, are not always predictable. I think we should just get on with it. Once the door is open, let the troops go out first. The door sure didn't slide like that in Bell Star's time. I'm sure of that. These doors are fitted and her doors replaced when our ancestors built this freehold. The soldiers moved through as if they expect ambush. Nothing happened, but they were ready just in case. Elder Johnson removed an identical key on a chain from his pocket. This is your key. No more will we slink in and out of the lower tunnels. Today marks the beginning of our return to the surface. Thanks. I'll keep it safe. Bye, Mom. We'll be back. Ian, Lars, Kelly, and Two Feathers walked abreast through the open doors and didn't look back. It was 0935, and they were off. The officer in charge of the platoons called them back inside and stood with the others as they watched them move down the path away from the freehold. Secure the door! The officer stepped up and pressed a red button. The 
doors resumed their closed position, then calling the soldiers to order, marched off, leaving Elder Johnson, Rachel, and Cassie to walk back home. It's noon. Is anybody hungry? Yes. Uh, find clearing and all this nasty tall grass. I think we should take a break. I'm an anthropologist, not a bison. There's a spot about 600 yards ahead where the Robeson staged a hut. We can stop there. Good. I need to change my shoes. The light canvas is fine in freehold, but my three-quarter boots will be better. I forgot to change before we came out the door. That's a rookie mistake, young one. Don't grouse too much. She'll remember when we're not so wound up. We're in open, non-filtered, sun-warmed air and free to see the world. <sighs> I'm famished. It isn't that exciting. Okay, so I took a literary license out before we left this morning. Sighting the hut, a small affair, we were ready to eat. Once inside, we pulled dried beef from our packs, soaked it in water for a few minutes, and ate. After breaking our fast, talk resumed. We've about a four-hour walk to the crossroads. We'll camp there tonight. The four of us will have a watch of two hours each. Lars will take the first and I the last. Kelly should take the second because the hours leading to my watch will be comm unit call-in time. Ian, you should make the first day and each day reports then. Lead the way, Lars. Let Kelly up front too. I'll bring up the rear. With that, they left the hut in good order. Banter continued for the better part of the first hour. Only Ian and Kelly kept the conversation going. Two and a half hours into this leg of the trek, they spotted a group of once humans boldly walking up the path toward them. Two feathers raised a hand for them to halt as the two groups met on the path. There were 20 of them and only four of us. Well met, we are here in peace. We are looking over the land and waters for a place to move our people. Ian recognized the sign language as an old American standard as he watched the leader of the band of once humans step forward. We speak English. I'm Kessa, head person of the Remnant of Foresters. We stayed in Wichita Refuge to maintain barriers when the cataclysm came. We may be few in number, but we are mighty. The fireside stories tell us of returning of the humans to the surface. Many of our people did not believe that there were people that would come, especially from the hidden cities under our feet. Um, are there many of your people? We number only 60 score. We intermarried with those who once lived in Medicine Town, two days walk east of here. Together we live on. We call ourselves foresters. What are you called? I am a Navajo. I guide and work with these people from the Freehold. It is under the mountain called Scott. Do you have old maps to know where that is? Yes, we have old maps and new maps. Carto drawing is a skill passed down to us. Who leads your band? I do. I am young for the job, but have wise advisors. Well, trek with us to cross paths. It would be good to meet our Nay people. The meetings of our paths can keep us safe from the Law Tones. They are warmongers from southeast on our precious maps. They steal our dogs for food, but are frightened of our electric fences. Law Tones are few, but more than the foresters. We do guard well. Do you hear of the wonder called Robe Sun? Kyle Robson was my father. A smile bloomed across Kessa's face. Her company seemed excited, almost jubilant at the news. Can you tell us tales of the old ones as he did when I was very young? Fire watch evenings get quiet too fast without good tales. The Robeson told us more people would come. I can, but Lars can tell them better. It might be a good idea to walk with these people. Yes. I know of the foresters from your father. We will travel safely in their company. This is the first time I'll spend with one's humans. As we walked, they gathered plants, fungi, and ran a line of traps set in sight of the trail. The traps held recognizable rabbits. The rabbits were larger than I'd seen in the illustrations from my school books. 
I also began to realize that these people were very tall compared to we freeholders. I knew that freeholders averaged five foot seven inches for minutes. Two feathers was six foot six, and they were taller than me. There were six fingers and toes on their hands and feet. The women were larger than the males, which struck me odd. In nature, many species females were larger. They all had red or blonde hair. A biologist would have had a field day just watching them walk. Their gait was rolling, almost fluid and clearly slowed down for our comfort. Very little hair showed anywhere and their clothing covered little. It was late summer. March was going toward fall as the poles had indeed flipped. My compass, an heirloom from the forest pollution, pointed to what our map said was south. I could see now that the axial tilt was also more pronounced. True north and true south would be about 15 degrees of magnetic. That was greater than it had been. I had expected desert, but this was tall grass everywhere. Two feathers talked with the males toward the front of the group. I was beside Kessa, who said almost nothing. Lars was madly writing as he walked. I supposed he'd have answers to me when I queried. Kelly looked rather shy and uncomfortable. She spoke only when someone spoke to her. When they gathered, they never fully stopped moving. Kessa asked mostly about our state of education, and that surprised me. I learned that they were literate, as it were almost their most basic rite of passage. I began to realize that her intellect rivaled any of my tutors. Were we the ones humans, and they the superior species? Dad had recorded that human need and nature in here. We make good time and we are ready to set up camp by 17.30 hours by Dad's watch. Kessa told me not to worry about the lost ones. They never attack such a large group as ours. We started to set up camp. Ian, could you help me when you've got your tent tied down? Sure. I've just set this last rope to tie. What did you talk about with that woman all afternoon? All the women around me wanted to talk about was babies. I didn't know what to say. When life expectancy is under 50 years, everything would come much faster than in the freehold. Kessa is middle-aged at 30. Her children are having children of their own. She said she was 12 when she chose her mate. I guess I'd be an old maid then. I can't even imagine having a baby yet. We aren't even adults in the freehold until we're 18. Their ways are not our ways. Lars will have divined the particulars. Dad's notes from Survey 9 were clear that the ritual is much more important to them than to us. From what I gather today, marriage is a big deal to them. We don't even commit to a partner for life in the freehold. We take to a mate for the time it takes to raise a child to school age, which is normal to us. Dad says that religion wants guided marriage. He always looked sad when he talked about mom leaving. He never coupled again. Kids at school thought he was weird. I still don't understand it all. I'm beginning to understand. The histories I've been reading and all, our ancestors believed in monogamy. The freehold started out with a gene pool of 8,000 and monogamy wasn't going to widen the pool. Once locked inside, they made a series of choices that allowed us to survive. These people had to make choices too. They survived because their ancestors kept morals and duty high on their minds when faced with choices. It led them down a different path from the one we are on. Are you sure you're 13? Only because mom told me that's how old I am. She says that we are as old as we need to be. Right now, you need me to be older, so I'll try. You're a good friend. Later that evening, we sat around the fire with the foresters. Kessa and Lars told stories of those who came before. 
It was wonderful listening to the past come alive. Lars wasn't always the most accurate with details, but stuck to the moral of each story he told. I noticed Kessa was very accurate. The last story fell to Lars. 2,031 years ago, we went down a hole dug into Mount Scott. There were 8,000 of us. The Army of the United States, Corps of Engineers, the country that was and is no more, chosen well. We had the books, computers, engineers, artisans, academics, and the normal people we needed to survive. We could, and did, communicate with the other freeholds. Kelly over there can tell you how. The why is easy. We didn't want to be alone in isolation. At times, we were venturing out of our prison to see the world and trade inhabitants with the other freeholds. That was arranged by our elder council and the leaders of the other freeholds. <sighs> we thought we had enough equipment stored for 3,000 years. We grew our food and learned what the old books and our teachers taught. Now it is time for us to leave the freehold. We have outgrown the spaces we can make for us to live under the mountain. It could all come crashing down on itself, if we keep going the way we have. It may seem that we had the best of the survivals, but I see you foresters and wonder if we were wrong. Yes, your bodies adapted, as did ours. You have done so with dignity. Kessa, you even came out to meet us because you had seen our preparations. I thank you for that. We are here to confirm the site the scribes have scouted for us. Over the past 200 years is a sound choice. It is time to leave the Freehold. Uh, did the Robeson tell you where he'd recommended? Yes, yes. He told us of his plan. My own father built a cabin on Jed Johnstone for use in maintaining the hardest concrete of the dam. Yeah, it will be work to live there. The ancient pictures would not do today's place justice. Trees have broken the ancient rocks and soil covers them thinly. The lake is deeper in the earth than his pictures showed. Here's what he gave us. These are the drawings of what is there now. I thank you for all of us. My father's notes say we can build houses of wood or stone. That we can even dig out caves for those who would prefer. I will trek there and plan over the next two weeks how to best get started. I'd like your help and company if that might be possible. No, sadly I cannot stay. I brought my son, daughter, and five of our soldiers to go with you. Your father was a good friend to us. He taught us many things in Trek's past. But I must return to our leader and tell what has been seen. He knows of the robes and plan. It was in your father's debt for seeds and knowledge that we now grow wheat rather than gathering the wild rye. No longer do our people grow mad from the fungus that grow in wet rye grain. He showed us how to preserve food for the winter that doesn't spoil. And he showed us how to use our breath and reeds to shape melted sand for glass, which is his greatest gift and the help to the foresters. Not all of those that you will meet will be friendly. The Comanche had all but died out before the ice grew. Today they are many thousands strong. They weathered the storms but are as angry as a dog poked with a stick. They live just north and east of Law Tones. The Law Tones are butchers. It is said that they eat their own babies and steal children to enlarge their clan. I hope that is not true. We have fought them. They are few and getting fewer. Something in the old ruined city poisons them. The other peoples we have met live far away from the old cities. Many claim that those places are haunted. I don't want to go there to find out. The sun has been gone for several hours. It is time to rest. Sleep easy tonight. We will watch. With that, she rose. The others rose as well. We left the fireside for our tents. We still hadn't met those who'd go with us to Jed Johnson Lake. Our map showed the way. I found I missed the hiss of the air handlers in the freehold. That thought surprised me. I slept sound that night alone in my silent tent. Tomorrow would start the first adventure. It was supposed to have started today. 
I guess it really had. My father was preparing the way even before I was born. Next week, Ian and company finish their first survey and they report back to the council what they found. Will Ian tell Keita of his feelings for her? Does Lars get aggravated at the situation? Tune in next time to find the answers to these questions. Thank you for tuning in to the Kyleson Chronicles, a sci-fi audio drama and novel with a twist. It's written by J.A. Babian, narrated by Charlie Wyrack. Your announcer is Tracy Babian. And here's our cast. Tom Cat is Lars Olofsson. Floyd Jones is Jay Witherspoon and James O'Brien. Ellie Hirschman as Don Wilson. Mark Pullen as Steve Kirkson. Micah Henderson as Ian Kyleson. Echo Uncles Bay as Cassie Robeson. Bruce Jaworski as Elder Tad Johnson. William Jaworski as Jack Bilson. Lisa Sedevy as Rachel Robeson. Tracy Babian as Kelly Kirkson and Kessa Forrester. James Sedevy as Two Feathers. Sven Neukrantz as the professional musician for the Kyleson theme. Belle Thompson as Crown Sound Effects. And J.A. Baby as Kyle Robeson. To our fans, thank you for listening. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and share this audio drama. This is your announcer, signing off. Are you in the mood for a good laugh? <laughs> or maybe a good scream? How about some childlike wonder? Or a thought-provoking mystery? Then get your ears ready for a treat, because the Mutual Audio Drama Network presents shows every day for your enjoyment. Each day is a different genre featuring the talents of a huge pool of audio drama masters. <laughs> Oh, and some clever comedy creators as well. <laughs> Subscribe to the Mutual feed and get them all, or choose the genres you really love. <gasps> You'll find the Mutual Audio Network at all your favorite places, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, EarBuddies, Podcastorama, Casting Call, Codpast, and wherever quality shows are found. Okay, I made a few of those up. Or simply go online to MutualAudioNetwork.com. And of course, it's all free. free. The free. Mutual Audio Drama Network. Listen and imagine together. Maintaining social distancing, of course.